To our top story now, and it was an explosive day at the COVID inquiry yesterday with Dominic Cummings accusing Boris Johnson of being surrounded by useless civil servants. And today, one of those civil servants uh, said that the former aide had reportedly called her the C word. Uh, she took the stand. Uh, former Deputy Cabinet Secretary Helen Mac McNamara began her evidence by criticising the jovial and macho culture at Downing Street with a Prime Minister who was difficult to confront. It was striking that something that I felt personally was obviously deeply worrying, that the, there was a sort of de facto assumption that we were going to be great without any of the hesitancy or questioning or that sort of behind closed doors bit of government which isn't about saying everything's smashing and going brilliantly, but actually being a bit more reflective and checking that everything's going to be quite as great as we'd like it to be. I wanted to ask you whether um, this was just sort of macho posturing or, or whether it actually had an effect on policy. Um, and, and is it the case then, do you think, that this approach you're describing uh, slowed down or even prevented the government from doing perhaps the messaging that it ought to have done? I think it will be quite hard for me to know, because there is a, you know, if you, if you are in that sort of meeting with that sort of prime minister in that sort of environment, it's quite hard to be the person who injects a note of caution. Well, she also echoed criticism that there was no plan for dealing with the pandemic and addressed the language used by Dominic Cummings towards her. The things that Mr Cummings, having seen those messages, it was, you know, it's not... It's horrible to read, but it is both surprising and not surprising to me, and I don't know which is worse. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to work. I was doing my job as a civil servant, and uh, that I'm confident about that, and the way in which it was considered appropriate to describe what should happen to me, yes, as a woman, but yes, as a civil servant, it's in disappointing to me that the Prime Minister didn't pick him up on the use of some of that violent and misogynistic language. Joining us now is James Heal, political correspondent at The Spectator. Uh, welcome, James. Uh, well, a lot of... Uh... Uh, colourful language flying around at number 10 at the uh, heart of the COVID crisis. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's that much to worry about. A lot of pompous people say, oh, you can't use those kind of words in the... Well, you know, every office, we know what they're like. It doesn't necessarily mean an office is dysfunctional because people are swearing at each other and calling each other nasty names behind their backs. In fact, I would suggest it happens in every office. Uh, but what we're getting here is a shocking picture of dysfunctional chaos. A boss who no one could relate to, uh, who apparently changed his mind with every person he spoke to. Uh, civil servants and politicians not interacting at all. Uh, Dominic Cummings at the centre of it, uh, accepting no responsibility for this dysfunction, uh, but uh, with a kind of, I would say, a seriously unhealthy disregard uh, for politicians in particular. His name for cabinet ministers was appalling. Uh, I don't mind the language. It's just the contempt that I don't think helps at all. So I think that's the story that has emerged. I didn't think this COVID inquiry would produce any decent stories. Uh, I think the COVID inquiry is ridiculous because it's not even considering whether or not lockdowns worked. It should be. Uh, however, this is a story, this is a hell of a story, that this country, at the height of its worst crisis since the Second World War, uh, was a dysfunctional basket case run by a guy who couldn't organise a booze up in a brewery. Uh, it's really, really disconcerting, isn't it? It is, and I think yesterday we had all the fireworks, the expletives, the explosions, Dominic Cummings. Today we had a much more sober, contrite appearance from Helen McNamara, and I think that really emphasises how this wasn't just one faction of Number 10 or wasn't just the political um, moment, the political members of the Number 10 team saying this was the civil servants as well. And I think the fact that Helen McNamara, who of course Dominic Cummings said he wants to handcuff and lead out of Number 10, was now basically corroborating a lot of his account today, uh, really shows that actually it wasn't about necessarily people with partisan agendas, they all thought, actually, Boris Johnson wasn't doing a great job in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and I think that we saw that today in the evidence, and particularly some of the examples, the lack of planning. And uh, already we're seeing people like Matt Hancock emerge quite poorly from all of this.
Yeah, James, one thing I want to ask you, which I find very puzzling, is Dominic uh, Cummings, infamously called a career psychopath by Michael Gove, uh, throwing everyone under the bus <laughs> but himself. Now, Gove's ex-wife, Sarah Vine, has said that her husband at the time was saying that he was quite impressed by the way Boris Johnson was handling everything, that he was <laughs> rising to the challenge and deliberating very sensibly on what the best steps would be and having due care and attention, essentially. And this, of course, was the man who stabbed Boris Johnson in the back previously, so you wouldn't expect praise coming from him automatically. We then learned that Boris Johnson called Cummings a liar about the Barnard Castle trip, claiming that he had no idea that uh, Cummings had gone up north, even though Cummings said to him, sort of gaslighting him, well, you know, you're a bit fuzzy-headed because you weren't well. I did tell you, but you must have forgotten. <laughs> what I don't understand in the context of all of this is why on earth that press conference was called for him, for Dominic Cummings at that critical moment, when it's clear the man was, you know, really stirring the pot internally inside number 10 in the Cabinet Office at a time of national crisis. What made him so indispensable that even Boris Johnson felt the need to very publicly protect him when he knew he'd been lying? Well, I think you've got to remember, of course, back in April 2020, it was only um, well, five months previously since Boris Johnson had pulled off an election victory, which many thought was against the odds. And at the time, Dominic Cummings was a very powerful figure, uh, much more so than your typical chief of staff in number 10, I would suggest. Uh, and I think that he was still very much in the ascent and it was most of his people running number 10. So I think that's perhaps the reason why. And I think at that stage, uh, we, you know, I'm not sure how much Barnard Castle will feature in all of this, but I think that there was very much a sense of the government wanting to stand behind its people uh, and therefore did not uh, try and give any kind of um, ammunition to critics who were concerned, you know, on the basis that if they were going to weaken the public health messaging, remember all that really like fierce messaging, etc. So they didn't want to give any ammunition to them. So I suggest that that was why Dominic Cummings, um, you know, was, was defended by the prime minister and spent another, I think, six, seven months in Downing Street under Boris Johnson. Uh, Helen McNamara was notoriously called the C-word by uh, Cummings, uh, and she has told today of how she felt constantly to be the recipient of a kind of contempt born of a macho culture, jovial macho culture. We hear that incredibly, e even in the heart of the COVID crisis, you know, Boris Johnson was being, you know, boostering and going, oh, we'll be OK, we'll get through this, you know, all of this stuff. So what she's actually saying is that number 10 under Boris Johnson was full of public schoolboys uh, who didn't have much time for women. Uh, that, again, is worrying, isn't it? Well, I think, especially in the context of how was it affecting decision making, Helen McNamara made the point that, you know, domestic abuse victims, issues around abortion were not considered properly, particularly at the start of the pandemic. I remember at the time uh, writing about the beauty sector, which employs, you know, uh, thousands of jobs across the UK and their concerns that they weren't being felt, unlike perhaps, you know, the attention that was given to pubs. So I think that there was a concern that well, how much does that in impact in policy making? I think that's one of the big issues we're going to see over the next year or so. But yeah, I think the, the what's come out of Helen McNamara's evidence today is really the kind of, it wasn't just the sort of how many men do you have, et cetera. You know, it was also the kind of culture at the time. And it it lent into what was a very kind of have a go hero kind of culture. Where everyone wanted, wanted to save the day. And that meant a really stressful environment in which no one got the best out of each other. And we led to this utter chaos and dysfunction, which is now emerging from the past two days. I mean, it is worth mentioning, of course, that uh, uh, she was ethics chief and McNamara was the one who provided the karaoke machine for that infamous party that they had uh, in Dowding <laughs> Street. So, you know, her hands aren't completely clean on all of this. Um, but what I find extraordinary, actually, is listening to some of the evidence over the past two days, it seemed that the government already had in place a behavioural insights unit, something that was based upon psychology specialists um, who would know how to communicate messaging. And yet the cohort in number 10 decided to go their own way, the sort of Dom Cummings campaign cohort, and completely ignore that advice. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those big issues. That was the concern around the time of, you know, 2020. Um, remember, of course, after the first lockdown, when suddenly in the summer, everyone was saying it was fine. And there was the concern that the hands face space campaign, stay home, save lives, protect the NHS, was actually far too effective. And we saw on Mon uh, yesterday that uh, Lee Kane, who was the number 10 commissary at the time, was saying he was involved with that. Um, it was a real issue about how do you get the balance right between the economy and public health. Uh, and I'm sure that's one of those issues which is really almost, you know, everyone will have a different kind of view on that. As you say, Alex, I think it's something about behavioural insights it took a long time to get used to post-pandemic. And I think probably the economic consequences of that I was still living with even now. Uh, the other uh, shocking revelation emerging from this inquiry uh, was that Boris Johnson allegedly 
uh, could not get his head around the tragedy of old people. He said, well, they're going to die anyway. What's the big deal? So that's uh, a very worrying aspect of all of this. Uh, but also, uh, Helen McNamara, uh, you know, as she said, wasn't really listened to, but she went into Cummings and said... Uh, and now, she used some pretty fruity language herself at this point. Uh, she said, uh, "We the problem here, Dominic, is we don't have a plan. We have a full-scale pandemic, and we don't have a plan. And then she said, we are F-worded. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, frightening, frightening. that th This was a, a, a chaotic office run by a guy that nobody particularly trusted to be at all organised. Uh, and here they had this massive crisis, this medical crisis, and they had not a jot of a plan to deal with it. Uh, it, it extraordinary. Uh, but also Helen McNamara, we'll play a little clip now. Uh, being a civil servant, uh, she blames Brexit for everything. Take it away, Helen. Good question. I'm not sure whether there would ever have been a normal patter, pattern of working for Mr Johnson. Um, but I do know that the kind of monomaniacal focus of him and his political team for uh, reasons which I'm sure that they would uh, happily give on just focusing on EU exit from July 2019 and then getting to the election meant that they at least in the way it was communicated to us, everything else could wait, everything else could wait till after this question was settled. So there you go, James. She blames Brexit, uh, but then again, the civil servants blame Brexit for everything. <laughs> uh, however, when she made this point about, look, we, she apparently virtually screamed it in the office, we have no plan, and the COVID crisis was already fully upon us. Again, what a frightening thing to learn. Yes, completely. And I think that there are two um, real issues which struck with me listening to all of that this morning, one of which was, you know, her claim that uh, Matt Hancock was saying, oh, we have a plan, we have a plan, which she took, didn't investigate because she took him on his word and actually turns out there wasn't a plan to deal with any of this. I mean, I was on Talk TV last night with uh, Andrew Lansley, who was the former health secretary, and he was saying he was talking to ministers around this time and they were saying, oh, we're using your plan for this. Well, number one, that plan was drawn up in 2011, not 2020. Number two, that plan was to deal with uh, influenza and not a COVID um, style virus outbreak. And the second point of this today also was um, the point where Boris Johnson got ill in April 2020 and the civil service had to really just draw up a plan themselves, apparently, because there was nothing available. They were relying on precedents. Well, I have to ask, you know, how much were they familiar with the kind of precedents of the 1950s when Winston Churchill and Anthony Eden fell ill? They really don't seem to have been. And if there's that lack of institutional knowledge from the civil service, I mean, we can all point fingers at the politicians. Equally, there ought to be some big questions asked about the machine. It's often said that the army is always fighting the last war. The concern about this is that the civil service was fighting the last disaster and have they actually learned i mean i think the answer from this is no answer is nowhere near clear yet no, absolutely uh, just before you go james uh, let's talk about uh, arguably the other big event going on here in britain today and that is the ai conference uh, the great and the good flying in from all over the world people going what's elon musk doing there well i think he knows a lot about it uh, uh, i would have thought it would have been a, an omission for him not to be there people just hate him because he's rich uh, but uh, he's there Kamala Harris is there, uh, so expect fireworks from Kamala. You know what she's like. Uh, she rose without trace and now exists without trace. Uh, but seriously, what, what, what can we expect from this summit? Uh, anything concrete? What will happen? I think really we are operating quite novel ground here and AI is something which most politicians really don't understand. So they've signed this declaration this morning. They want to get everyone sort of at least by, by the same rules. There's been a concern about why should we invite China, for instance? Well, you know, AI is one of those things, a bit like nuclear weapons. According to the experts, if we don't get this wrong right, it could you know, lead to all sorts of disasters involving humanity. So it's one of the ones where you need collaboration, a basic kind of you know, dialogue on all of this. Uh, it comes at a time when America has just signed, Joe Biden has just signed an executive order on AI, um, getting the government involved in this now half a trillion dollar industry over there in America. Um, so it's something that I think world leaders want to talk about. OK, not all the world leaders can make it, but I think it's important to get a kind of basis on which you can kind of dis have discussions and therefore discuss where is this going to go? Because talking to the experts, I say half of them think it's going to kill us all.